Hello, my name is Michael Lambert, and uh, today I want to talk about a few stories that I've seen in the, the newspapers in this last week or so, which are quite interesting. Now, you might have heard that our uh, our GDP in uh, April to June was up by uh, 0.6%, and that uh, unemployment is down from 44 to 4.2%, which is virtually no unemployment. And uh, we all know already that we're doing better than Germany, doing better than France, doing better than the EU. Uh, we're the fourth biggest exporter in the, in in the world. And on the face of it, it seems that there's some sort of economic miracle taking place. Uh, no doubt due, as as they would claim, due to the fantastic management of the economy of um, by the uh, the Conservatives. Although I'm sure Labour will want to want to claim some of the benefit, even though they've only been in power for uh, a, a, a few weeks. But uh, as I say, I've, I, I found one or two stories which I think sort of question just how well we're doing and whether it's actually a miracle we're experiencing. And uh, I, I wanted to tell you about some of these stories. Now, one of the reasons for leaving the EU was to stop uh, people from the EU coming here and taking all our jobs and uh, and taking all our houses and claiming benefits and uh, and using the National Health Service. You know, I mean that was the, that was the big the, the, the big sin really. The fact that some of them very very occasionally might use the NHS, which we pay for. The fact that we 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 used to go to to the EU and uh, and occasionally we would need to use their health services, or, or, or the fact that. Uh, thousands and thousands of people bought houses and retired to the EU and that was slightly different really it wasn't it, it wasn't like them coming here and, and, and doing the same to us so we had to really stop that we had to re really get rid of all these um, these uh, people from the EU and, and that's worked really well because hardly anybody is coming here from the e EU anymore it's too difficult too complicated we, we, we've really made it uh, um, too difficult and uh, so what we had to do was to start uh, bringing people in from other parts of the world, particularly from India and Nigeria. And uh, there's been a, a huge flood. And of course, the, the Tories, as you know, have brought in a, a limit of £37,000, which you had to earn. You had to get a job earning £37,000 before you, before you could get a visa to come here. And that seems to have been a great deterrent. It seems to work really, really well because applications uh, to come here and, uh, and work or to study have, have, have collapsed. Applications for universities, for example, are down a third. Now, a lot of people used to come, they used to bring relatives with them, whilst they, you know, if you had a husband and wife and so on, they'd they want to bring their partner. And uh, applications for university places from foreign students have fallen by a third. And uh, this is a bit of a problem because uh, the e universities earn about uh, £9,250 a, a term for uh, from UK students, whereas from foreign students they get 22,000, which is almost two and a half times as much. And so a lot of universities depend upon foreign students to make ends meet. And uh, the fact that the applications have fallen so so much uh, means that they're going to be short of students, unless they're going to lower their standards for UK students, but also they're going to be short of money. And it's said that uh, a number of universities could actually be threatened with bankruptcy because of the, the, the collapse in, in uh, foreign students coming here. But the most important uh, fall in uh, in applications to come and work here by foreigners has been in the healthcare sector. Now, we all know we're absolutely desperate in the healthcare sector for nurses, for doctors, and especially for care workers, uh, which is a, a, a low-paid job, which um, is very, very important. And... Uh, those applications have fallen by 82%. In, in other words... Very, very few people want to come here and work. Very, very few people work in the care sector can get a job earning £37,000 a year anyway. And so what is already a, a big problem in the care sector is now going to become a much, much bigger problem. Unless, as the uh, uh, as the uh, government want to do, we train up our own people. We haven't got an awful lot. If you've only got 4.2% uh, uh, unemployment, you've got... You haven't got a big pool to train up to do all these thousands and thousands of jobs that desperately need doing. Uh, and not only that, uh, according to the to the BMI in a in a uh, uh, BMA in, in the uh, Financial Times last week, apparently one in seven doctors trained in this in, in, in the UK goes to work abroad. And uh, you know, I I, I I know of people who have uh, qualified doctors and. Uh, others in the, in the health service who've gone to live in Australia and Canada because there are better opportunities there and things are, are not looking that bright here. 
Now, one of the interesting things about uh, the fact that we were so short of workers, we started advertising in India and Nigeria and so on. And between uh, uh, December 2019 and uh, December 2023, uh, of new jobs, uh, 487,900, that's nearly half a million, were taken by Indians. And uh, 278,700, not far short of 300,000, were taken by Nigerians. That is more than the 257,000 new jobs taken by uh, by UK nationals. In other words, an absolute flood of uh, of Nigerians and uh, uh, and of Indians to take up new jobs in this country. And uh, uh, you have to wonder what what for. Why? I, I mean, a lot of it was to replace people who used to come from the from the EU. And if you look at the list of countries in order uh, of those who actually left since uh, since Brexit and, uh, and and have gone back to their own countries, presumably uh, the majority have come from uh, have gone back to uh, Chechnya, Slovakia, uh, Lithuania, Hungary, Poland, uh, Latvia, France, Denmark. Spain, the Netherlands, and Italy. In other words, Europeans. We got rid of Europeans, which is which was the object of Brexit, one of the main things of Brexit. And instead, we've got in a hugely more people, vastly more people from, here we are, Nigeria, India, Bangladesh, Zimbabwe, Ghana, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Iran, Turkey, China, and Philippines. Now, when you take into account social integration and so on, I mean, how have we benefited? The only way we've benefited, of course, is that a lot of people from a lot of these new countries are prepared to work for less pay, except, of course, that now they have to earn £37,000 before they're allowed to come here. So the whole thing is a completely, uh, com- complete and utter mess. Now, a story I, I spot in the uh, Telegraph, it's not a paper I, I, I read, the Telegraph incidentally, which I think is, is about to be bought or uh, the owner of GB News is trying to, to buy it at the moment. And it's said that, uh, uh, also I think uh, uh, that fine and upstanding statesman, and Nadim Zahawi, the, the gentleman who you remember, may remember when he was uh, Chancellor Exchequer very briefly, suddenly realised that he'd, he'd forgotten to pay um, £3.5 million pounds in, in tax, which, which, we, which we all do from time to time. It's very easy. Um, anyway, he, he, he could possibly be the, uh, uh, the new editor. Oh, sorry, the new owner. And, and it's said that uh, Boris Johnson might become the, the editor. So that sounds a really, really excellent combination there. But anyway, story in the Telegraph last week, and it was all about planes being serviced. Now, uh, previously, when we were in the EU, UK planes could be uh, could be serviced in the EU, and EU planes could be serviced in the UK, and and, and obviously it happened to a certain extent. But uh, we didn't want uh, we didn't have the same standards for, for anything for as the EU. We just want to be different, and uh, so we we decided that uh, people in the EU. Were, uh, we weren't accepting the standards anymore, and likewise they said they weren't accepting our standards. So uh, it's not possible to get. UK plane service in the EU anymore and vice versa. And so people who can't get their plane service in the, in the UK have to send them to America. And this is, uh, is very expensive and complicated. One airline in particular in the story, uh, an airline called One Air, um, said that they have to send their planes to uh, uh, to the US and it takes uh, uh, an extra two weeks. It takes 41 days to get a service and it costs 1.7 million as opposed to 1.25 million in the uh, having them serviced in the EU as they were previously. So it's another half a million. And, and he says in the, the, the sky quoting, he says that, uh, that the costs obviously get passed on to the uh, to the consumer. So that's a complete and utter and absolute waste of time. Uh, but you can understand. I mean, you wouldn't really want to have your planes uh, serviced in a country like France or somewhere where they make um, where they make uh, uh, Airbus. Would you? Now it's said in this article that uh, that uh, European facilities, that plane repairing facilities, they can apply to the UK for a separate UK license, but it goes on to say they are unlikely to do so, given the additional cost and red tape. Uh, cost and red tape, which is totally, utterly, completely unnecessary. For forty-five years, we're quite happy to have them service our planes, but not anymore. No, no, no. Their standards different. The UK government wants a deal with Brussels on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications as part of its push for closer ties with Europe. But EU officials have poured cold water on those hopes. In other words, they're not much bothered. 
Another story concerns uh, manufacturing. Now we've become a service economy, 80% of our exports are services now, and we're manufacturing less. But the extent to which we have our manufacturing has collapsed is really uh, uh, quite remarkable. In this article, again in the Telegraph on the 29th of July, it says, uh, Britain has fallen out of the top 10 manufacturing nations for the first time since the Industrial Revolution. That's 260 years ago. In uh, 2000, we were in the fifth place. We're now, we're now 12th behind Mexico, Italy, Russia, France and Taiwan. And so it's pretty clear that we're just becoming a, uh, a, a service economy. And it's uh, given that uh, it's one of Keir Starmer's missions that we should be uh, consistently the top performing uh, economy in the G7. And considering how we're doing now, uh, I would have thought relying entirely on services is going to be quite difficult, and uh, I'm not quite sure who's going to buy buy our services. You know, obviously, we've got lots and lots of absolutely brilliant uh, businesses and, uh, uh, and uh, outstanding sectors, both in manufacturing and in services. But whether or not we have enough service uh, uh, businesses to make us the leading com uh, country of the G7, I don't know. It says here there's been a collapse in productivity growth since the uh, financial crisis. It averaged 2.3% per year in the three decades before 2007, but has now slumped to about uh, uh, around 0.4% per year ever since. But the last story, and the main story I really wanted to talk about, is one that I've been going on about now for, for at least two, two and a half years, and that's the question of of food security and food from, from the EU. You know, a huge proportion, 50 odd percent, I believe it is, of our food comes from the EU. And much of it, the vast majority, comes through 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 Dover. And uh, this has been an on, on, on ongoing fiasco from, from, from day one. But I spotted this in The Guardian, 4th of August. Uh, of August. Imported food coming into the UK through Brexit border post is being sent back to Europe to be tested due to lack of laboratory capacity in Britain. This is according to um, a group called the SBS Certification Working Group, which represents 30 trade bodies uh, covering 100 billions worth of UK food supplies. Now let me explain what happens as I see it. A boat comes into Dover and off trundle 50 lorries or 100 lorries whatever it is they're not checked at dover at all they're just waved through i'm not sure if they even do passport checks maybe they do but anyway they're waved through and they're told to go to a place called sevington which is about 22 miles away now there is no control over where, where they go the, the lorries are not sealed they can go anywhere they can unload part of the loads whatever at night or anything can happen but anyway uh, eventually they're t t told to turn up at this sevington which is a, a great big car park in a field Cost us 127 million, and it's there to to check uh, check goods coming from the EU. Now, uh, it seems from this article and from this story that uh, uh, what happens is that you have, for example, a lorry uh, full of German sausages, and uh, it's picked as one is going to be checked, and so they say we're going to have to check your sausages, and so they they take a sample and they send it to a laboratory. And the laboratory, according to this, it seems, that the laboratory says, oh, we can't do this, we're too busy this week or whatever. So what they do, they put it in a little packet and they fill out lots and lots of forms about export forms and so on, and they send it to a laboratory in Germany. And there it's tested. And then the laboratory in Germany, they, they then say, uh, uh, presumably they have to issue a certificate or something, and then send it saying that the, the German sausages that, 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 that we sent to you that are parked up in a car park in Kent are perfectly safe for consumption and, and they can be released. And then in Sevington they, 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 um, they, they can send, send them on their way. Now Sevington is, a, it, as I say, it's a huge, huge facility and it's, it's, it, it's, uh, it's managed by a firm called Sodexo. And Sodexo is a family-owned company, belongs to, uh, to a French family. And Sodexo, you know, we're not very good at running things. It's good. Sodexo, they also run eight or nine of our prisons. They provide food for hospitals and schools and universities, all sorts. And it's a huge company, but they're guarding on border. And uh, I was then thinking to myself, I wonder who owns 
in Dover Port. I thought I'd look into it because, as you know, in this country, gas, electricity, water, the railways, all majority owned by foreigners. You know, they've got Hinkley Point uh, uh, power station, this amazing power station, which is partly owned by the French, partly owned by the Chinese. Uh, Folkestone, for example, you know, uh, Heathrow Airport is owned by foreigners. Gatwick Airport is owned by foreigners. Um, Folkestone, which is the, I think, the second biggest, after Rotterdam, second biggest container port in Europe, that's owned by, 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 by the Chinese. And uh, um, Southampton Port, which is the second biggest uh, container port in the UK, that's owned by a firm in Dubai. And the London Container Port, which is the third biggest, that's owned by another firm in Dubai. So most stuff is, uh, is uh, most important infrastructure is owned by foreigners, it, it would appear. And I was astonished, absolutely astonished to find that uh, the Port of Dover is actually British owned. So that's, that, that's a good thing. I, I, I'm sure as soon as anybody realises that, it'll, it, it'll be sold off. I don't know what we're doing with it. Uh, it's, um, it, it really, really surprised me. But anyway, all these checks and all this uh, messing about is really is really for this reason. When 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 we left the EU, the the Europeans said, well, they knew that we were going to start importing all this chlorine washed chicken from China, from America, although we'd hoped to. We're not, in fact. And these uh, hormone injected uh, uh, food from uh, Australia and New Zealand, and so they they were concerned about that, and they set up all these. Uh, uh, checks on food coming from the UK into the EU. So we sort of uh, tit for tat. We said, well, we're going to set up our own by um, uh, our own controls and so on. It took us a long time. It's taken, uh, well, I suppose, what was it, eight years since uh, the referendum, and it's at least uh, four years since we left the EU. So it's taken all that time and within five delays, but eventually we've set up these uh, the, the, these controls. But the reason given for it is it's to uh, it's to enhance uh, Britain's biosecurity and stop the introduction of diseases into the UK from the continent. You know, for was it 40 years, stuff could come in without any checks, any sanitary checks. But now suddenly, we've got to check everything, and all this huge expense. It said that the cost. Additional costs in all these checks are somewhere in the region of 330 million a year at the moment, and no doubt it'll go up. And of course, it's all going to get added on. It'll all uh, result in higher food prices, and in uh, in people not supplying. And I just want to read a couple more uh, uh, sentences from this particular report from this SBS working group. As I say, represent a uh, hundred million pounds worth of uh, imports of food a year, 30 different organisations. And they say in it, uh, in some cases, the high charges render some imports commercially unviable. Some logistics firms are saying that uh, changes have added up to 60% to transport costs. It then went on to say, EU exporters have stated that on expiry of current supply contracts, they will review whether to continue to supply, the, supply Great Britain given the new regime and associated issues. The EU, the, sorry, the UK brought in reciprocal measures in January, raising fears that some EU firms may abandon exporting to the UK owing to the extra costs and bureaucracy. And that is it. As I say, I've been banging out about it for a very long time. I mean, we know the unit that we, we, we know that our, our wonderful supermarkets, I mean, they're, they're, they're working on tiny, tiny, tiny profits, aren't they? They wouldn't take advantage of us. And so they're not going to put prices up that they can possibly avoid it. But I, I think they'll have a job avoiding it, really. I think we're all in for uh, 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 food shortages, poorer quality food, probably a certain amount of unfit food will get smuggled in and undoubtedly high food prices is just just absolutely inevitable and when you hear about this chaos here uh, down at Sevington and uh, uh, how, how utterly chaotic the whole thing is really and uh, just can't believe it anyway that's what I think about it those are just a few a few few things that have caught my eye this week um, if you haven't already subscribed, I'd be grateful if you do so. And uh, so until next time, thank you for listening and uh, bye for now.